Continuing in The Will to Believe and Other Essays in Popular Philosophy by William James, we now come to the fourth essay, Reflex Action in Theism. I think I'm going to see if I can do this one more quickly, and we may spend uh, a lot less time on some of the other essays in this book uh, than we did on the first on the first three essays, The Will to Believe, Is Life Worth Living, and The Sentiment of Rationality. Reflex Action in Theism is originally an address delivered to the Unitarian Ministers Institute at Princeton, 1881. So he's talking about a particular uh, a particular theory in um, human physiology, largely also a theory in psychology, and how it may apply to belief in God, what it may say about theism. Reflex action and theism is his topic. Uh, what is reflex action? He says, we're in oh, the fourth paragraph. I refer to the doctrine of reflex action, especially as extended to the brain. In a general way, all educated people know what reflex action means in, in his context. It means that the acts we perform are always the result of outward discharges from the nervous centers, and that these outward discharges are themselves the result of impressions from the external world carried in along one or another of our sensory nerves. Applied at first only to a portion of our acts, this conception has ended by being generalized more and more so that now most physiologists tell us that every action, whatever, even the most deliberately weighed and calculated, does so far as its organic conditions go follow the reflex type. So he's talking about a theory called the theory of uh, reflex action, which states that our actions are the third step of a process. The first step is the reception of uh, impressions from the external world. The second step is whatever happens after that and before we act. And the third step is action. Uh, he'll go into a little more detail on, on three steps. Uh, first, we receive uh, impressions from the external world. We, we sense things. We perceive things. Second, the information is carried along by the nervous system uh, to the brain, and we make some sort of mental response. And then third, we act. You could almost shorten this by just saying stimulus response, but it would be a little better to... Uh, uh, to phrase it in perhaps terms such as these. Perception, mental response, action. Perception, mental response, action. I think those words are fairly, fairly approximate uh, contemporary English uh, parallels to what James is talking about. So what does this have to do with theism? And uh, the theory is that this is how human beings normally act. We react, uh, we act in response to uh, uh, sense, we react in response to perceptions via the five senses, taste, sight, smell, hearing, touch, perceptions via the five senses of the world outside the mind. Our actions are a response to those perceptions. And our actions, as a response to those perceptions, uh, include whatever we may do uh, in between, uh, in between where we, where we think of ourselves as... Um, uh, weighing and calculating, uh, as deliberating, when we think of ourselves as thinking and making decisions, perhaps exercising free will, when we think of ourselves as doing this stuff, we're still uh, responding to perceptions of the world and planning action in the world. And so all human action seems to fit nicely into this uh, reflex action model of human nature. What does this say about religious belief? Let's get there as quickly as we can. First, the sensory impression exists only for the sake of awaking the central process of reflection, and the central process of reflection exists only for the sake of calling forth the final act. So now let's, uh, let's perhaps refine our terminology. First, sensory impression. Second, central process of reflection. Third, the final act. Sensory impression Central process of reflection. One, sensory impression. Two, central process of reflection. Three, final act. Let's, uh, let's try to keep that terminology in mind. Okay, so perception and thinking are only there for behavior's sake. The ultimate purpose of the whole thing, the ultimate purpose of one, perception, two, thinking, three, behavior, maybe that's the triad we should stick with. Uh, the whole point of this, uh, the whole point of perception and of thinking is to enable behavior. Uh, perception, thinking, action, perception, thinking, behavior. Uh, maybe those are the uh, maybe those are the words we should use. Again, what does this have to do with uh, religious belief? Well, we'll get there in a moment. What I wish to ask is whether its uh, influence, uh, that is to say, uh, the the influence of this theory, 
Whether its influence may not extend far beyond the limits of psychology, even into those of theology herself. Does this theory, properly speaking, classify as a theory in human psychology? Does this theory uh, say something about theology? We are not the first in the field. There have not been wanting writers enough to say that reflex action and all that follows from it give the final blow to the superstition of a god. There have been many who have said that this theory of reflex action well, refutes religious belief. There was a time, however, remembered by many of us here, I'm skipping just a few lines, when the existence of reflex action and all the other harmonies between the organism and the world were held to prove a god. So, uh, reflex action um, posits the theory of reflex action in human psychology. Remember, James is a psychologist. He wrote the book, The Principles of Psychology. If you have to name the major characters in the history of psychology and name the founders of psychology, uh, I'm not sure if everyone would list James in every possible list, but uh, many people would very properly place him uh, as one of the founders of psychology and one of the major historical psychologists. Okay, uh, James says, this theory in psychology uh, that human action has this uh, three-step process. Uh, external impression, the central process of reflection, and the final act, or perception, thinking, behavior. Uh, perception, thinking, act. This, uh, this triad this theory that this is that this triad is how human behavior works. This theory posits a harmony between the human organism and the world. And if some of our thoughts are of a god, this may be taken to show that God exists. That's how some people have thought, uh, or at least to show that uh, ration, uh, religious belief is quite rational. That uh, belief in God is very proper because you see uh, sensory impression mental act and then action in the world is a process by which human life harmonizes with the world and if that life includes religious belief and religious action and the whole process demonstrate a harmony between uh, thought and life and world well then uh, probably god does exist after all that's what some have said but now there are many people who say that this reflex action theory uh, is the final blow to the superstition of a god now they are held to disprove him the next turn of the whirly gig may bring back proof of him again. Um, people have said this model for thinking through human nature proves God exists. Now they're saying it proves God does not exist. Or at least it proves that belief in God is a mere superstition, uh, a mere uh, product of human reflex. And now James is going to suggest maybe, uh, maybe we should go back to the other way of thinking. Maybe this supports belief in God. Into this debate about God's existence, I will not pretend to enter. I must take up humbler ground and limit my ambition to showing that a god, whether existent or not, is at all events the kind of being which, if he did exist, would form the most adequate possible object for minds framed like our own to conceive as lying at the root of the universe. So he's not technically going to say, going to argue whether God exists. He's going to argue that belief in a god is, at any rate, very proper. That The kind of God, uh, the kind of being we think of as God, is a being the existence of which would form the most adequate possible object for minds framed like our own to conceive as lying at the root of the universe. Uh, let me try to put this in other words, and then I'll go back to his own words. If we observe the full extent of this human process of perception, thinking, action, we will find that certain perceptions, thinkings, and action do fit the world best. Certain uh, instances of this triad of human perception, human thought, and human action do fit the world best if indeed there really is a God in the world. My thesis, in other words, is this, that some outward reality of a nature defined as God's nature must be defined is the only ultimate object that is at the same time rational and possible for the human mind's contemplation. Anything short of God is not rational. Anything more than God is not possible if the human mind be in truth the triadic structure of impression, reflection, and reaction which we at the outset allowed. Now, I, I actually like how I, I keep uh, switching up my language, finding different ways of paraphrasing things, uh, most of them borrowed from James. I think this is the first time uh, we've seen him use this phrasing. Uh, Impression, reflection, reaction. That's a very nice uh, three-word summary of the three-step process. Reflection, perception, reaction. 
Uh, I think maybe I'll try to stick with uh, changing my mind once again. Impression, reflection, action, perhaps. Perhaps I'll stick with that. Anyway, what is he saying here? If the human mind is indeed uh, a triadic structure of impression, reflection, action, which uh, this, this theory of reflex action posits, if that's the case, then God must exist because our because some of the particular details of our impressions, thoughts, and actions only fit the world if there is indeed a God. Theism, whatever its objective warrant, would thus be seen to have a subjective anchorage in its congruity with our nature as thinkers. So he's not arguing, again, that God exists. He's arguing that uh, it's proper to believe that God exists. He's arguing that a belief that God exists is the most coherent belief given the particular conditions of human thought, given the structure of human thought, given the way human thought works, a belief in God uh, is very proper. There is uh, a distinction, as you may know, between an argument that God exists and an argument that you should believe God exists. We're familiar with this distinction, uh, probably most of us originally from Kant. Uh, James is very similar. He rarely argues, if ever, that God exists. I think you'll find no such argument in this book, at least. Uh, you might want to take a very careful reading of the concluding sections of the varieties of religious experience and see, perhaps, if there's an argument there. But for now, let's just say, no argument that God exists uh, in this book, as I, uh, if I'm not mistaken. He is arguing, rather, that it's rational to believe that God exists, somewhat similar to Kant. Uh, not in all respects similar. I don't think James is going to say you ought to believe that God exists, while holding off on arguing that God exists, although I think Kant will tell you you ought to believe that God exists. James is, is telling you, you may, it's perfectly rational. Anyway, what sort of, um, what sort of uh, aspect of human thought, what sort of uh, content, what sort of content of our impressions, and what sort of content of our reflection, and what sort of characteristic of our action in the world in response to this content and reflection, to complete the, the content, reflection, action triad, what sort of perception, reflection, action might require uh, the existence of God if uh, we are to have reflex actions, uh, responses to the world uh, that properly fit the world. Let's see. Now, first, let's make this observation, skipping roughly a page. What I've called the reflex theory of mind, skipping a number of words, commits them, that is to say, all physiologists, well, let's um, rephrase his words in a coherent sentence, uh, but first of all, let me ask you to linger a moment, is the paragraph I'm in, if you want to look at the text on Gutenberg.org or something. The reflex theory of mind commits us to regarding the mind as an essentially teleological mechanism. I mean by this that the conceiving or theorizing faculty, the mind's middle department, functions exclusively for the sake of ends that do not exist at all in the world of impressions we receive by our senses, but are set by our emotional and practical subjectivity altogether. It is a transformer of the world of our impressions into a totally different world. The world of our conception. And the transformation is effected in the, per in the interests of our volitional nature and for no other purpose whatsoever. Human thought has a teleology, a purpose. There's a purpose built into human thought, and specifically this uh, this middle step, the, the middle step of reflection, the mind's middle department, the conceiving or theorizing faculty, has the purpose of acting, the purpose of acting in such a way as to take the world as we perceive it and modify it according to well, according to our perceptions formed, sorry, according to our conceptions reform, formed in response to our perceptions. Okay, let me try to <laughs> say that again uh, in fewer words. Human thought has a certain structure, triadic structure, three-part structure of perception, reflection, and action, or perception, conception, action. Uh, another way of phrasing it in three words, perception, conception, action. And 
The whole thing has the purpose, ultimately, of acting, but that acting is not understood independently of all these other things. Uh, no, they, they all go together. What happens is we, human beings, have perceptions of the world, then we form a conception in response to the perceptions, and according to that conception, we act in order to uh, modify the world in light of those conceptions. Uh, perceive, consider, craft some sort of uh, some sort of theory, some sort of response, uh, some sort of um, craft in response to our perception, some sort of theory about the world, and then act according to that theory. But it's action that affects the world. Now, again, what does this have to do with God? Let's uh, let's go to let's go to this passage. Now, what are these essential features? That is, essential features of theism. Now we're getting to uh, belief in God. What are the essential features of belief in God? First, it is essential that God be conceived as the deepest power in the universe. And second, he must be conceived under the form of a mental personality. The personality need not be determined intrinsically any further than is involved in the holding of certain things dear. And in the recognition of our dispositions toward those things, the things themselves being all good and righteous things. But extrinsically considered, so to speak, God's personality is to be regarded like any other personality as something lying outside of my own, and other than me, and whose existence I simply come upon and find. A power not ourselves, then, which not only makes for righteousness, but means it, and which recognizes us. Such is the definition which I think nobody will be inclined to dispute. He's giving a sort of a brief description of the essential features of theistic belief. We conceive of God as existing uh, independently of us and as having a mind and as being the deepest power in the universe, uh, the ultimate reality, so to speak, and as uh, preferring certain things to others, which are the good things, the better things, the best things. Now, what does this have to do with the theory of reflex action? Well, we are here dealing with a particular uh, conception. There's a three-part structure to human, human life, human consciousness, and uh, a three-part structure to how the mind works. Uh, there's uh, perception, conception in response to perception, and then action guided by that conception, which will have some effect on the world, which, of course, will result in uh, somewhat different impressions in the future, uh, different perceptions in the future. Perception, mental conception and response, guiding action that uh, has some effect on what we perceive in the world in the future. And uh, this belief in God fits in in that second bit, uh, a particular conception of reality. Uh, the objects, the object that confronts us, that knocks on our mental door, we're skipping, I don't know, a paragraph or so, uh, two halves of two paragraphs. The object that confronts us, that knocks on our mental door and asks to be let in and fixed and decided upon and actively met, is just this whole universe itself and its essence. What do we perceive? We perceive the universe and its essence. In the first stage, what do we perceive? The universe and its essence. What are they? And how shall I meet them? And there, then, you must decide on a particular conception of the universe. The whole flood of faiths and systems here rush in. Philosophies and denials of philosophy, religions and atheism, skepticisms and mysticisms, confirmed emotional moods and habitual practical biases, jostle one another, etc., etc. But no one of them itself is final. They form but the middle segment of the mental curve and not its termination. These are all different conceptions. All our different worldviews are different conceptions responding to our perception of the universe, perceive the universe, conceive of it in a certain way, choose some, uh, between some, all these different theories, atheism, different kinds of theism, and <laughs> everything in between, uh, and everything uh, else. Uh, all sorts of pantheism, panentheism, theism, monotheism, trinitarianism, uh, polytheism and, and and atheism and agnosticism, everything else, and all of them have the purpose of getting us to that third stage, action. Uh, these uh, they form but the middle segment of the mental curve, and not its termination. We easily delude ourselves about this middle stage. Sometimes we think it's final. Sometimes we fail to see, amid the monstrous diversity and the length and complication of the cogitations which may fill it, that it can have but one essential function, and that the one we have pointed out, the function of defining the direction which our activity, immediate or remote, shall take. This whole 
uh, massive human construction of different theories, different religions, different philosophies, different accounts of reality. It's all just the second part of human consciousness and of human life. And consciousness is for the sake of life. And this whole second part has for its purpose the third part. It's all as a means to an end, not as a mere end in itself, but as a means to an end of living. So, what sort of conception is properly formed in response to these uh, perceptions? And what sort of conception leads to the right sort of action? That's the question. And James is uh, going to say that belief in God, uh, belief in the accepting these essential features of theism he's just described, is an appropriate uh, conception in response to our perception of the universe, which will lead properly to the right sort of uh, action and response, guided by that conception. Our volitional nature, uh, we've skipped a certain number of paragraphs. Uh, our volitional nature must then, until the end of time, exert a constant pressure upon the other departments of the mind to induce them to function to theistic conclusions. Our volitional nature, uh, here he should be cross reference to his earlier work, well, earlier in this text anyway, The Will to Believe, the essay. The volitional nature, or the will to believe, or perhaps the will not to believe in the case of some of us, always exerts a pressure upon the other departments of the mind to induce them to function to theistic conclusions. The will to believe uh, pushes us towards believing in God. The whole array of active forces on our nature stands waiting and patient for the word which shall tell them how to discharge themselves most deeply and worthily upon life, rewinding a few, no rewinding about a paragraph and a half, the need to act, the whole array of active forces of our nature, the need to, to take that third step in human, uh, human consciousness, requires us to choose among all the different available conceptions. And it's appropriate for the will to believe to uh, push us to choose the theistic conception amongst all the other choices. Now, theism, next paragraph although between the second last thing I read and the last thing I read. Now, theism always stands ready with the most practically rational solution it is possible to conceive. Not an energy of our active nature to which it does not authoritatively appeal, not an emotion of which it does not normally and naturally release the springs at a single stroke. It changes the dead blank it of the world into a living thou with whom the whole man may have dealings. The theistic conception as one of the options for stage, stage two of this process tells us to think of the world, to think of uh, reality itself as something personal or something uh, guided by some superior person. It tells us that the world we perceive can, is to be understood as a personal reality or as guided or controlled by a personal reality. And this is a rational belief because it enables the right sort of action in the world, which is a human action. And the whole, part, the whole purpose of a belief, the whole purpose of a conception in stage two is to get us to stage three according to the theory of reflex action. So theism, theism is justified. Belief in God is justified by this theory of reflex action. Assuming we can finally understand why exactly it is that James thinks that Action in the world is, the right sort of action in the world is supported by this particular uh, conception of the world. We have to show, uh, we have to give him a chance to tell us why the theistic conception enables the right sort of action. Well, I think we've already seen it. Uh, there's this interesting sentence uh, going back to the, uh, or did I, <laughs> maybe I'm in the same paragraph I was just a moment ago. Now theism always stands ready in that paragraph. Now theism always stands ready with the most practically rational solution it is possible to conceive. There's an interesting sentence in this paragraph. To you at any rate, I need waste no words in trying to prove its supreme commensurateness with all the demands that department number three of the mind has the power to impose on department uh, number two. Uh, he's saying to his audience of uh, Unitarian ministers uh, in the 1800s, 
uh, or people aiming to become Unitarian ministers, perhaps college students or seminary students aiming that direction. Uh, I'm honestly not entirely clear uh, who is in the room when he originally delivers this address to the Unitarian Ministers Institute. Does the institute include Unitarian ministers, or um, uh, since it's an institute at Princeton, does it include primarily uh, students aiming to become ministers, or a good bunch of both, I don't know. Uh, he thinks to his particular audience of ministers or future ministers, he doesn't actually need to put forth a lot of effort to explain that the theistic worldview will... that the theistic worldview may be selected as one of those uh, stage two options because of our need to live properly in stage three. In other words, he's not going to go into a lot of detail. If you want the detail, actually rewind. Go back to uh, is life worth living and to the sentiment of rationality and to the later sections of the essay, The Will to Believe. But let's uh, review what he does tell us here. Theism always stands ready with the most practically rational solution it is possible to conceive. Not an energy of our active nature to which it does not authoritatively appeal, not an emotion of which it does not normally and naturally release the springs. At a single stroke, it changes. At a single stroke, theism changes the dead blank it of the world into a living thou with whom the whole man may have dealings. What theism does is it tells us that this whole universe we perceive, it tells us in stage two that the whole universe we perceive is something with which in stage three we, human beings, may usefully interact. Theism is the worldview that tells us that there is a higher power who cares about what's right and that our actions can have an effect on the world in the direction of supporting what's right there. That, that's why. That's the connection. That's why it is that the need to act properly in the world, stage three, can impose on us in our choice in stage two of how to assess what we perceive in stage one you can tell us in our choice of stage, in stage two, to select the theistic account. The theistic account enables the right sort of action because it tells us how to conceive of the world. And how does it tell us to conceive of the world? Let's rewind to the essential features of theism. Uh, the divine personality uh, need not be determined intrinsically any further than is involved in the holding of certain things dear and in the recognition of our dispositions towards those things, the things themselves being all good and righteous things. According to the essential characteristics, the generic characteristics of theism, God, the person of God, holds certain things dear and recognizes that we do as well, and as the greatest power in the universe is there to support those things and to support us in our efforts towards those things. The theistic view is what enables human action in the world. The, the reflex action theory of human nature tells us that we perceive the world, we must then come to some theoretical account of the world, and then we must act on that account in the world, and the human need to act well in the world requires us to be able to choose that conception of the world in stage three, the needs for stage three being the ultimate purpose of thought, life being the purpose of thought, allow us, even require us perhaps to select in our stage two conception of the world the conception which enables the right sort of action. The right sort of action is the sort of action that makes life better, that makes the world better, that takes the world as we perceive it, accepting all the testimony of experience and comes up with a conception of the world in response according to which uh, there is a higher power who who cares about what is good and who cares about what we care about as long as we also care about what is good and whom we are thereby enabled to join in action in stage three. The theistic worldview is the best bridge between our perceptions of, of a world that needs uh, that needs us to to work on it and our need to actually work on it in stage three. Uh, somewhere much later in the text, not a sensible fact of department one must be left in the cold. Not a faculty of department three be paralyzed. Department two must form an indestructible bridge. Reflex action theory tells us that we perceive, conceive, and then act accordingly. And we shouldn't leave out any of the facts. 
but also every need to act properly must, since action is the purpose of thought, must be allowed to have its say in what we choose to believe in stage two. As long as it's consistent with the available facts and enables the right sort of action, the theistic conception is permissible and even best if it does those things best. And it does, it's consistent with all the perceptions and does enable the right action. Well, thus says William James. Uh, if you've been watching a lot of this stuff, you've noticed that this is uh, uh, largely a distillation of early essays, in particular, I think, of Is Life Worth Living? So if you don't understand this or don't agree with it, consider, um, consider the earlier essay in the text, Is Life Worth Living, for more direct look at some of the essential connections. Thanks for watching. If you've actually watched this far, 30 whole minutes, <laughs>